Welcome again to today's Trends in IT, everyone. My name is Chris Lehner. I'm an enterprise architect here at Ingram Micro. And uh, joining me today is Etienne Gadient from CloudLogic, also an Ingram Micro company. Welcome, Etienne. Uh, greetings, Chris. What we're going to cover is uh, kind of the continuing theme of, of how do we create budget for customers and clients that are financially challenged, which mm -hmm. is uh, a wide swath of it, most people's customers and clients. Mm -hmm. uh, more specifically, we want to focus on how to do that uh, around a customer's cloud implementation and, and their cloud presence. Um, there's probably not a lot of folks out there that have a cloud implementation that haven't gotten some form of sticker shock, especially <laughs> early on in their uh, in their cloud lives, in their cloud implementation lives. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to talk a bit about that, um, kind of dissect where that that sticker shock comes from uh, and, and what can be done about it. So let's start kind of at the top here in terms of, uh, you know, where these where these cloud costs are coming from, in particular, the, the surprising cloud costs. And, you know, a little bit more, um, I guess, detail on that, or I guess a little bit to parse that a, a bit more is, you know, there's it's somewhat between uh, infrequent and uncommon that uh, when a customer moves into the cloud, they do so with a grand, well thought out, well structured plan. Usually, or everything that is going to en <laughs> encompass their um, their entire cloud infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it's somebody who who does have a great plan like that, or somebody who perhaps dips a toe in the water and then builds ad hoc in the cloud after that. Um, are those the kind of things is it that level of structure or lack of structure that's driving a lot of surprise costs? Or are there other things that, that factor into uh, a customer's ultimate cloud bill, regardless of how they, they venture into the cloud? Yeah, first things first, I would say that, that uh, we have a different profiles of customers, like you said. You have customers who who choose to start out in the cloud because they're a startup. You have customers who who go and have a large legacy environment and go through a detailed planning process and budgeting and total cost of ownership analysis, elements like that. And you have customers who sort of get dragged there kicking and screaming that one of their departments is actually what pulled them in or a couple of their departments decided to go instead of going through IT to deploy that into the cloud. And, and so each one is a unique profile of, of why the bill's a surprise, but invariably we find the vast majority to uh, to find that cloud costs grow much faster than they were expecting. And so when we, when we look at why, uh, it's that most analysis that they do for the ones that did actually go out and do the, the pre-planning, most analysis that they do is really around the compute components. So what will happen is they'll say, okay, I know I need 50 virtual machines. This is the appropriate size of the virtual machine. They'll make a guess at that, or they'll use tools to help them size and scale that. Every one of the hyperscalers have tools to help them with that. And they'll come back and say, okay, now I know roughly what my compute costs. And, and so as a result, that will give me what my cloud cost should be. What, what is usually missed in, in those cloud costs are all of the hidden and ancillary support fees. For example, um, I have load balancers that I have to pay for. I have things that I already pay for in my data center, the security tools, the log aggregation tools, event managers, all of those types of things all have uh, are all typically replicated in the cloud and those are never budgeted into the analysis additionally uh, it's really hard to do an analysis on what your egress fees are going to be most people don't realize that that every um, data is free to bring into a cloud it doesn't cost you anything from a network perspective but coming out of a cloud depending on the volume that can be anywhere from four to eight cents a gig so there are a lot of hidden fees and, and, and they end up stacking up. So it's fun. Everybody starts with the compute tools, but at the end of the day, there's, there's a lot of other components to factor into it. But as you say, there are literally dozens of other um, services and infrastructure components to, mm -hmm. to certainly consider that cool. a lot of people, I think, don't clearly take into account straight away. And on top of that, there's, uh, like you alluded to, especially with data egress and a lot of uh, a lot of smaller things. I don't want to call them hidden charges because truly I think that the cloud vendors do a very good job of making that information very available and including including it in their calculators. But a lot of folks simply forget to uh, forget to try to account for those things when they estimate their bills. 
you once you get into the real world situation where you're moving data around and you're setting up infrastructure and you're starting to trigger those pay by the drip services it's it's very difficult to see what those data amounts and what those uh what those corollary charges turn out to be so so it, it sounds like there's a lot of things that contribute to uh what we have referred to as sticker shock for customers cloud bills mm -hmm. um that, what uh, what are the options on the table for customers to try to address that and try to rein in those costs? Yeah, invariably, customers usually start out with a tool. So there's uh, there's a wide variety of them: Cloud Checker, Turbonomic, Cloud Health. Um, there's others. There's even even the cloud providers themselves. Microsoft acquired a company called Cloud9 that's now Microsoft Advisor. AWS has uh, has Trusted Advisor. So all of these tools are 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 very powerful. But in particular, the third party ones uh, offer you three different ways that they can help you find savings. They'll they'll sit down and look at it from uh, the perspective of compute. So they'll start and look at it in terms of, hey, you've over allocated over provisioned resources to this asset, and as a result, you're 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 wasting money because that you're 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 using a, a, an image that's larger than you need. The second one is where they'll look at it and say, hey, you, you, you don't use this workload on evenings, weekends, things like that, and so as a result, you can shut them off. Uh, on during those times, and if you're under a pay-as-you-go program, that generates immediate savings because you only pay for what you use down to the second. And then third and foremost, um, a lot of companies default to using things called reserved instances. They're effectively long-term contracts that basically say, I'm going to commit use of this resource for one or three years, and I'll pay for it either up front or I'll pay for it monthly. And as a result, because I'm giving you that guarantee, the cloud provider will turn around and give you anywhere from 27 to, to, to 58, 59%. So depending on what it is, there's the, and, and so these three different methods, the tools excel at being able to tell you how to go solve. They'll come back and say, um, for example, Ingram Micro offers Cloud Checker. And if you as a partner are bringing your cloud spend through Ingram Micro, um, Cloud Checker is typically charged at 1% of your monthly recurring revenue rate that you pay for, for the cloud provider uh, flat rate. And, and Cloud Checker is, is free if you bring that spend through Ingram Micro. It also will go through and help you look at your security posture. And so that's that's a nice little side benefit, not related to cost, but at the same time, an, an important aspect of going to the cloud. The catch is they're an algorithm. And at the end of the day, the algorithm is really good at telling you things that it can predict. And so while those algorithms get better over time, the vast majority of what we see with that algorithm is those three areas. And so, so we find that the tools are very good at what they do, but they also are limited once you've done those things. Maybe this is an instance of the 80-20 rule or maybe the 67%, 33% rule. So what about that 33%? Uh, you know, where that the 33% of the bill that isn't really being addressed by automated tools and that, that's really gonna always be very difficult for tools to address. Where do you guys come in and play in that area? Yeah, this is an area where we genuinely are unique in the industry. So so most organizations that you work with will focus on working with what the tool will tell you mm -hmm. and will ultimately manage and curate those tool outputs and then and then turn them into actionable items. The way we differentiate ourselves, I would say, is that we find savings in 10 different areas. And and that comes in a lot of different ways. That comes from looking at your architecture that comes from sitting down and engaging with you to understand if the security segmentation that you've put in place is generating unnecessary cost. That is everything, it, it's looking at how you do storage life cycle. It's looking at all of the various elements and, and working down them in terms of, of being able to find costs that are unnecessary within your with, within your environment. So we're really excited about the fact that we can bring these 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 seven other areas that um, that tools are are candidly very limited in being able to generate benefit for. Well, it, and it's an interesting distinction, too, because those things that you listed that you guys are looking at um, and addressing are very much predicated on having experience in in this field, right? It's not something that you can uh, put a point a tool toward and have it detect something that's on or off or too big or too small. 
it is mm -hmm. more of a, uh, a qualitative um, element to being mm -hmm. able to determine how well something's organized or how well something's engineered within their cloud presence. So, mm -hmm. as I said, to me, that kind of implies the need for uh, for bringing a great deal of experience to be, able to, to be able to identify and address those areas. So, you know, we, we talked about a couple different ways that uh, that the tools can take money that, that you guys can look at, at configurations and cloud environments and address them for efficiency. Um, if you have some examples around uh, around some customers and, and specific customer situations, that would be interesting as well. Yeah, absolutely. So so one customer we worked with uh, was a household name appliance manufacturer there, and they were being challenged by their by their uh, their finance organization to generate 10 percent in savings. Now, tools generate far beyond that. The catch was they had already made four passes with tools. They started with uh, with one set of tools did all of the recommendations they they then turned around and said well we think we can get more from this other tool so they they went and and invested heavily in that tool and took its recommendations and they went to a third tool and went and looked at those recommendations and ultimately then started putting things on long-term contracts and then finally went back to the first tool uh to to make sure that nothing had changed so if you think about it this was probably one of the most optimized environments that we came into uh in terms of uh, in terms of tools and and so their their leadership was coming back and saying well we, we need that's great that you've generated all of these savings but but we need more the partner reached out to us that was working with them and said is there you guys you guys say you do better than the tools is there is there something we can do here and so we did a proof of concept with them for example we looked at one of their 34 accounts that they had uh running within within a hyperscaler every single workload they had was under long-term contract there was there was absolutely nothing i could do from a compute perspective uh and yet we were still able to find them about 22 to 23 percent in savings and so how did we do that one we sat down and looked at storage for them the the storage that they were connecting to those compute assets and we realized that they were over provisioned for performance this is something that's very unique in cloud because uh in the data center, I think in terms of size and I think in terms of how big the storage array is in the cloud, I have to think in terms of how many IOPS does this need? And for certain types of workloads, uh, there's a there are ways that you can fundamentally change the 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 way that you're generating and reserving IOPS and, and you can cut the cost of that storage down by a factor of 3x, 4x or, or 5x in terms of one third to one fifth. Um, we looked at their their long term archival processes. We looked at their backup processes. We looked at how they how they architected the environment, and and found them um, fifteen or sixteen different unique ways that none of the tools were able to find. And as a result, we were able to exceed their budget goals. So that's interesting. In this case, it sounds like this customer, by way of using tools already, has had pretty well gone through the process mm -hmm. of of using automated tools to try to try to make their environment as cost efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and my first thought was, all right, well, it sounds like anything on top of that is just really going to be a function of diminishing returns in terms of whether it's another automated tool or a consultative evaluation like yours, mm -hmm. function of diminishing return where, yeah, we're putting a lot of money in and we're only saving very small fractions off of our bill. But it sounds mm -hmm. like even in this case, that wasn't how it turned out. So there's an example I can give you of that, which is uh, we looked at their load balancers. This this sounds like a rounding error. Like I mean, I've got hundreds of workloads. I've got tens of load balancers. How much am I really going to save? Well, uh, we realized that, that because of the way they were uh, provisioning those load balancers, they were paying for 30 of them when they needed to pay for one. And so that actually was a was a five figure, I and mean, that was in excess of ten thousand dollars a month in savings because of of just one configuration change that actually reduced the risk that they had with that asset and with those components. So there's that, there's a lot of different ways to go after it, but that's that's the catch is unless you have engineers and you have and you have experience with where to go look, it's it's really easy to pass over um, uh, opportunities for savings because. They require uh, they they require the, uh, the the context of knowing of knowing where to look and how to look at them. So even with having brought two tools to bear, you guys were still able to save sixteen to eighteen percent in this case. So 
Uh, that's one data point. What's I guess what's the range of, of savings, or can you quantify a bit more in terms of what what the range of savings is that you typically see with different customers in, in different configuration scenarios? Yeah, there's there's it really depends on the maturity level of the customer. Obviously, if if they've gone through many optimizations, the the ben, the percentage reduction is going to be less. But what we actually find the greatest opportunity space are clients that our partners are working with where they've just undergone a migration. And here's why. When, when you look at a client who is going through a large programmatic migration of workloads to the cloud, they are moving very quickly. So what ends up happening is a group going through a programmatic migration, nobody's stopping to go back and optimize it. And the reason for this is because once the migration's done, they've got another one scheduled right behind it. You're, you're literally in a workspace where all your tools are out and you've just gone through the process of building something. And instead of taking the time to clean up the tools, to get everything in order, you hand it off to operations and you go to the next migration and you get going on that. And, and so that's where we find there's a tremendous opportunity. And, and, and so I'll give you a couple of examples. Clients that we've worked with under those types of models, we can see 50 to 60% savings. I mean, because everything has gone through and, and they went through to optimize it to make sure they didn't disrupt the business, which is appropriate and good. But now going back and taking the time to make sure that we're not overspending is really, really crucial to success in this, um, in this type of model and environment. So we, we, from, from clients, we see anywhere from 30% to 50% savings that can be generated uh, based upon how rapidly they migrated Interesting. And uh, as one of my former managers always like to say, not insignificant. ROI aside, let, let's talk time to value then, right? Or if we're assessing numbers like these, certainly they're, I would imagine, intriguing for just about every customer you get in front of. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question in my mind, I'm sure, would be, what is the time to value? How long does an engagement like this take? And when can we start seeing some of that return? Yeah, this is a this is a really important question because the other thing a tool does not get you and again we like tools we value tools but a tool does not enforce a program so one of the most important things we do when we get involved with our with our customers through our partners is to to actually run it like a program where we sit down and we have dashboards that illustrate not only what the opportunities are and what has been saved we do we, we definitely keep an a scorecard of this is the amount of money annualized that's been saved, and this is the amount of money that that is potential that has not yet been saved but been identified. But we also take that two steps further, and this is really important because we find that most cloud cost initiatives don't fail because of the tools; they fail because of people. And so, what we what we've been able to do is to shift that conversation with with our partners and our clients to how are we going to make sure that you don't have roadblocks in the process? So part of what we do in, in the process is we track who's who's holding up approval of the change. So for example, um, if and we do this in a couple of different ways. First and foremost, we turn around and score the complexity of the change. So if I turn around and identify this should go under a reserved instance, there's no impact to production. It's just a contract change. There's no downtime. So why haven't we done that? What's What's holding that up? There are times where you may want to resize an instance and the downtime is a matter of minutes. Once again, why haven't we done that? What's holding it up? Is that an approver in operations? Is that the business unit? Is that IT? Or is that the change window that we're waiting for? And so this is very, very not sexy stuff. But the, what, what we find is that this is where the results come. This is, this is where, and we give them dashboards, we give them, we give them visibility and transparency into where every opportunity is in the process so that the executive in charge of the program can turn around and go and, and shall we say, exert influence on getting those things done. And so running it like a program is one of the most important things to, uh, to success in cloud cost op or optimization initiative. By taking a compare that or contrast that with a tool, a tool sends you an email every day. And, and that email says, hey, you should go look at this workload. It looks like it could be potentially resized. The person doesn't open the email, the tool is worthless. And, and again, that's a people problem, not a tool problem. We're big fans of tools. But at the end of the day, uh, if, if you're not running it like a program and you're not bringing the engineering skills, you're getting a much more limited set of opportunities. Some of those things you mentioned there are, I think, really quite important because of all the IT projects I've been involved on, 
there are a couple key aspects or a couple key ways that the customer looks at a project. And even a lot of times, apart from one is financial, right? We've all got budget that we have to abide by. Mm -hmm. Two is the technical technological aspect where the very often the notion is if I just throw enough new technology and hardware, maybe software at it, I can fix any IT problem. Um, and those are parts of the equation. Um, but what you're talking about is the the people, the process, the operational side of things. And you know, as you as you dig into really any kind of um, uh, like gardener and, and forester and, and, and consultancies like that, they heavily emphasize that operational aspect. By at least in rough terms, what that engagement cycle is like and, and what a customer could expect. So absolutely. In terms of uh, la the, to your last point, we have a we have a saying that you can buy the process or you can buy the outcome, and and we think by including operations and and the the approval process and and the programmatics, it really is you're buying the outcome as opposed to the process. And and whereas when when you're buying a tool, you're getting a powerful process, but it's still a process that you have to do. In terms of timing. Timing can come in a couple of different ways, but what we generally do is, is uh, in order to make sure that we, we, we maximize the value to both the partner and the client, uh, what we'll usually do is start with one account and do a proof of concept. Uh, to the partner, that's usually about $5,000. To the, uh, the they mark up, usually we see that from anywhere from about 7,500 to 8,000 to the customer. And one of the things we do is uh, we we get in and we come back to them with their top 10 findings. And, and so that top 10 findings will typically generate 4x return on investment so that by the time the partner's margin is included, it's a 3x return on investment. And, and so that that if they've if they've spent eight thousand dollars, we try to make sure that we get them thirty two thousand dollars in identified annualized savings as part of that proof of concept. What it also gives us a chance to do is be able to work within the environment, get an idea for how much there is to do, what what type of complexity we're looking at, and whether that and and whether that's an environment where there's significant savings. And then what we do is working with the partner, we value price that to make sure that we can maximize the margin that the partner benefits from in terms of uh, the 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 full engagement of however many accounts or subscriptions that they have. And that, that, by the way, is the same whether it's in AWS, whether it's in Azure, whether it's in Google. Uh, we, we work with them to make sure that that's something that, that they, can, they can benefit from. So generally what we try to do is target our cost of engagement to be about one third of the, actually one fourth, excuse me, of the ROI that the, part, that the customer is going to get. So if we've identified that we think there's a half million dollars in savings, then we want to make sure the partner has an opportunity to put 120 or 125 thousand dollar engagement in front of them. That's going to generate them 500 thousand in savings. So it's it's designed to be a four to one ROI, and and that gives the partner an excellent opportunity to capture margin, and uh, while also being on the right side of the table for them. You're you're literally working with them to help them reduce spend on something that they they are going to pay out every single month and is going to continue. Continue to grow. And so usually the timing of that, the, the proof of concept usually takes about two to three weeks. Uh, the full engagement depends obviously on the size and the scale, but the idea is to be generating savings literally in month two and uh, and and be generating savings throughout the life of the engagement so that as they go through any one of these optimization efforts and then hopefully future optimization efforts, we're, um, that is always cost positive and relatively short in terms of time frame. We're talking a few weeks. Very good. So you, you mentioned some of the, uh, the the financial interest for partners in that, which I think is compelling. But mm -hmm. uh, the other side of that coin is the position that it puts partners in with respect to their customers, i.e., mm -hmm. uh, putting them in, in to use the cliche that uh, position of trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you are providing consultative value, when you're solving problems for customers, uh, that puts you as a partner uh, in a pretty enviable position with respect to your customers. So I think that's uh, equally valuable, if not more so than than uh, the, the financial interest in this as well. So, well, that's everything that I wanted to run through. I, I, Etienne, appreciate you spending time today talking about this offering, uh, what you guys bring to the table. This has been uh, incredibly enlightening for me and I hope for everybody else watching things as well. One one more thing I want to just make sure the it, as as partners see this that they're aware of. 
which is that that the magic on this is that the ROIs are always measured in months. The return period is always measured in weeks to months, which means you think about any other TCO you do with IT where you can turn around and generate an ROI on that investment within a matter of, of three to 10 weeks. And all of a sudden you realize that that those those paths tend to get cleared because usually ROIs are measured in 12, I mean, anything under a year is generally considered to be excellent. And and we're we're looking at literally weeks to months in terms of of of, of an ROI. So these are these do tend to generate a lot of money and they tend to generate a lot of money quickly by offset spend to be on that side of the table to to be on the, the side of look, I, I I just saved you a half million dollars in annual rates. Now I've got a project to work with you on, and uh, and when we now know that that money has been budgeted, but is not going to need to be allocated. So why not? Why don't we go spend it on this project over here? Good. Um, well, as I say, one final question: How do partners engage with Cloud Logic on an opportunity like this, or really on anything that Cloud Logic brings to the table? So first things first: If you're a partner with Ingram Micro and you know your account manager, reach out to your account manager. Your account manager can always get to us. They know exactly where we are and how to reach us. If you do not know who your account manager is, Cloud Logic at IngramMicro.com. Uh, again, I'll say that Cloud Logic at IngramMicro.com. You'll be able to read that on the bottom and uh, send that in and a cloud logic resource will get back to you within one business day so we're really excited about our ability to impact our partners and help them be able to really change the conversation in cloud awesome well thank you again um as i said at the top my name is chris laner uh and we've been uh joined today by etienne gadien with uh, cloud logic and uh covering the 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 very interesting topic of cloud cost optimization for our customers and clients in the field. And uh, again, if you're looking to reach out and engage with Cloud Logic, uh, certainly your uh, rep with Ingram Micro is a good conduit for that, or Cloud Logic at IngramMicro.com is also a way to get in touch directly with the Cloud Logic team. Thanks again for joining everyone, and uh, we will see you on the next episode. Thank you.